Good evening. I'm Anuj Marotra, Dean of the George Washington University School of Business, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this who have joined us today. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome our special guest, President, GW President Mark Ryden. Thank you very much for being here, President Ryden. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity and seeing this short video of distinguished guests, I wonder why I'm here. <laughs> well, yeah, very humble of you. But before we get into the first question, I'd like to thank the GW Department of Athletics for our partnership in this event. My co-host, Tanya Vogel, Director of GW Athletics is not able to join us today. I am disappointed that she is unable to join. However, there is a silver lining that I get the benefit of the truly intelligent questions that she had planned on asking the president. And in case he does not like any of those questions, clearly those were her questions. <laughs> but seriously, I value our partnership as it truly demonstrates what makes us one GW. I'd also like to thank the audience for submitting many questions in advance, and we have really tried to incorporate them to the extent possible in the topics that we are going to discuss today. So let's jump right in, President Ryden. We are all interested in knowing what attracted you to GW uh, to become to be to be GW president. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been here now all of three months, and uh, I've been very stimulated. I've met really great people like yourself, who would be one of our great academic leaders. I've met outstanding students, and I've visited most every part of the campus. But when I was sitting in St. Louis, I was not looking for a new university presidency. I had served for 24 years as chancellor of Washington University in St. Louis, and I thought I was done. But uh, I was approached by the university in June of 2021 about the possibility of coming. And I mentioned to my wife that I was being uh, courted by a university, and she said, no way. <laughs> but then I told her it's Washington, DC. And we have a daughter who is a distinguished alumna of this school of business. And she has two young daughters. She and her husband live here in the district. And when I shared this with my wife, she said, let's do an adventure. And we decided that if we had the opportunity, we would come. Very well. So you mentioned your enormous experience of 24 years being chancellor at St. Louis and before that provost at MIT. So in terms of your experience of the three institutions now, the three months at GW, what is the DNA difference between these three institutions and how does that translate into your role as president? The great thing about American higher education is that each institution, though they would all say we educate, we do research, we provide service, and for those that have medical schools, we provide clinical care. But how we execute that mission is going to be very different. And each institution can develop its own programs, and George Washington University has many unique and important programs that neither MIT nor Washington University in St. Louis would actually have. And of course, being a chemist, I'm proud that virtually every college and university in America has a chemistry department, and we do too here at George Washington University. But uh, we have many programs of real visibility and quality that uh, are not evident at other institutions. And I'm often saying that we're not striving to be a Xerox copy of Harvard or any other academic institution. We need to develop our own elements of uniqueness and build our quality and impact to serve the world. Uh, great. So, uh, President Ryden, I've heard you maybe from this, uh, I'll take the cue from what you were saying. I've heard you many times, or at least a couple of times, say that every institution, every university 
is centered around some central common pillars, whether they are to do with student or whether they are to do with the faculty research or infrastructure, etc. And every institution strives to be distinguished and to some degree distinguishable. And I struggled with that word yesterday, I remember. But what are some areas of distinction and distinguishability at GW that in, in your three months that you have been here, you are able to see? Well, distinguishable is important because America has many talented students and no institution, no matter their quality, can actually accommodate all of the talented students. So I encourage distinguishability and distinction. And one of the schools that uh, has attracted my interest because I've spent a lot of time traveling internationally, building partnerships with academic institutions around the world, the Elliott School of International Affairs is extraordinarily important and I think relatively unique. Uh, of course, other institutions have programs related to international affairs, but we're in Washington, D.C. This could not be done in St. Louis, could not be done even in the great city of Chicago to the north of St. Louis or on the West Coast. We're in Washington, D.C., and taking advantage of our location uh, is very significant, and that adds distinguishability. Mm -hmm. It enables us to attract both students and faculty who would not otherwise think about this institution. And I found that to be a very important program. And I'm looking forward to learning more, uh, learning more uh, about other programs that add this element of distinction and distinguishability. Uh, I believe that we can take full advantage of being in Washington, D.C. I was involved in a program earlier today with the School of Media and Public Affairs with Frank Sesno, focusing on Planet Forward, an initiative that he started and one that is extremely important to many academic institutions. But we can do this uniquely well because we have policymakers, people who are contributing to the formulation of those policies, and we have the media. The media here are exceptional. And again, in a city like St. Louis, as great as it is, does not have a national media presence. Great. So uh, those are great points, President Ryden. One of the new exciting new initiatives, especially from my perspective as the dean of the business school, is really the Penn West Equity and Innovation District in D.C., um, with GW as the potential anchor institution located right, uh, right at the edge of the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District. I know you have had lots of experience, both in St. Louis as well as in, 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 in Cambridge, um, about your experience with innovation districts and, and that, that, have really, that you have helped foster. Where do you see this innovation district go in the next two or three years if things go right for GW? I'm really excited about the prospect of encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship I've met many talented students who have great ideas. Many faculty are at the forefront of their research, um, making important contributions that could be developed into new enterprises. And in Cambridge, Massachusetts, near MIT, and at Washington University in St. Louis, near our School of Medicine, uh, we in we developed uh, very important innovation districts. Each of those uh, settings is different than what we enjoy here. And I believe that we do have the potential to be the anchor institution. What's common about all these innovation districts, not just the three that we're talking about, is that each is uh, involving a very important research university. And in St. Louis, we certainly partnered with other academic institutions 
and we have the potential to do that here in Washington, D.C. also. But I learned about this uh, potential interest uh, during the fall. I made uh, six trips about every two weeks in the fall after the public announcement that I would come here, and I was excited to find that there is an interest in this innovation district. In talking with the government, the District of Columbia government, they say we're interested in feds, meds, and eds. And we're interested in meds and uh, the eds part. This innovation district will involve uh, elements of workforce development and certainly involve opportunities for our students and faculty to be involved in developing new enterprises right to the north of our campus here. And I'm so excited that in talking with the academic leaders here, every one of our schools wants to be involved. And I think that's quite exceptional. Well, we are very excited and, we, we, and I think we'll gain a lot from your past experience and as we move forward with that. So let me change a little bit connected to this, but the evolving markets right now are really uh, seem to increasingly need students with interdisciplinary perspectives, right? So what are some of the best mechanisms to provide education across academic boundaries uh, for the benefit of our students? Interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, uh, across school line activity is, is going to be very important. In referring to this planet forward initiative of Frank Sesno, uh, it's clear that many areas of intellectual activity, many areas of creativity must be applied to solving the world's problems. If you think about the big problems that we have to work on, climate change comes to the fore. As I pointed out earlier today, uh, being a chemist, I know that chemistry is, in some sense, responsible for some of the problems that we have. When you think about climate change alone, a simple chemical reaction, namely combustion of fossil fuel, is the source of the problem that we now face in terms of climate change. Combustion is the conversion of hydrocarbons to carbon dioxide and water. And we must wean ourselves of these fuels. And I'm pleased that George Washington University has a very strong commitment to the development of renewable energy. I myself have done research in electrochemistry, photochemistry, surface chemistry, when I tell people what I do at a cocktail party, they typically find someone else to talk to. <laughs> but if I come up with a technologically viable and economically viable new technology for converting sunlight to useful fuel, such as hydrogen from water, or converting sunlight to electricity, this has to be implemented. And in the United States, we do not have a single energy policy. We have at least 50 different energy policies associated with the 50 states. And the District of Columbia has its own unique government and rules and laws and such. The point is that a chemist alone, though we might be able to come up with inventions and uh, make contributions. We cannot do it alone. We need great business leaders. We need social scientists. We need political leaders who can contribute to the development of policies that will make these new technologies poss possible. And further, we have to be able to work internationally. So the point is that these large 
challenging global problems are not going to be solved by a single institution or school, not even by a single country like the United States. We must work collaboratively. And I believe that one danger in touting interdisciplinary work is that sometimes people believe that you can uh, devote yourself by virtue of passion. And what we need is people who are highly educated and have depth of understanding in disciplines and willing to work across disciplines. So we should not mistake the need for depth in science and political science, but we need people who have that depth but willingness to work collaboratively with other people. Thank you. Thank you for teasing out that very important point that you just made. Uh, let me change subjects a little bit here. Uh, based on my conversations with many CEOs, diversity, equity, and inclusion are on top of their mind, as well as for many of us in the university as well. And recent times have even questioned our country's ability to handle civil discourse. Would you talk a little bit about some of the key principles for building a framework for higher education institutions that will help build a more inclusive and equitable society? Diversity, equity, and inclusion would now be three words that uh, are on the minds, as you suggest, of every leader of any corporation, not-for-profit organization, and certainly for colleges and universities. We're preparing the next generation of leaders. And uh, I believe that our responsibility is to make sure that every person who's admitted and matriculates to the George Washington University has the potential to contribute and will be included. We need to be focused on not just seeing the face of America or the face of the world at our institution. We need to be proactive in making sure that people not only are included, but feel included, that they have the setting where they can realize their great potential. And this means being proactive in providing opportunities for leadership and engagement with our distinguished faculty. And I've been very impressed in coming here to see the incredible resolve of everyone from the board chair to those who are in, in any hiring position in terms of this focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and working to provide a work environment for all of us that is conducive to fulfilling the potential that we have in our students, our staff, and with our faculty. One of the things that uh, really impresses me is how strong this commitment is at the university. And I believe that uh, People here are walking the talk, as is said, and I'm very impressed with the results. However, this is not something that you can take for granted. We're right now in the midst of recruiting the next class of undergraduates. Uh, they come from all over the nation, from all over the world. They will be diverse. They will have different backgrounds. And we need to make sure that as they come, they adopt and embrace the values of this institution. The final point I would like to make is that I say we need to have a setting where people can realize their potential. And that means providing, for example, scholarly activities for our students that enable them to be involved in creative work here. 
All of our students have the ability to learn anything that is already known. In, in effect, they've demonstrated that. But what's exciting about being at a research university is that our students can be involved in creating new knowledge that can be valuable to society. And this is why, going back to the innovation district, why I'm so excited that we're dedicated there. And finally, our potential should grow as we move through the education and research opportunities. So the students who come are extremely talented. They already have great track records of achievement. But through the education and research experiences, I hope that they leave with even greater potential to contribute to society. Well, that was very compelling. And I think I'm learning uh, a few things here right now about uh, higher education myself from you. So let me, let, me, let me ask you a different question. We had an amazing day yesterday. Uh, giving Day was GW Giving Day. This was the second um, GW Giving Day, and we beat our goals by a margin. For students, alumni, faculty, and staff who are present here today hearing you, tell us why uh, philanthropy is important for GW's success. Philanthropy uh, is critical, in my view, uh, for institutions of higher education. And this is not unique to private research universities like the George Washington University. This applies also to public institutions. Philanthropy in America is relatively unique, almost completely unique to the United States. I'll tell you a short story. A CEO of a major company headquartered in St. Louis, uh, having business globally, was asked to be on an advisory board for Oxford. And uh, in the course of that engagement, uh, he was asked to help them raise money. And he was able to raise money, but in the United States for Oxford University. Not so much in the United Kingdom. <laughs> the resources provided by philanthropies enable us to recruit talented students through scholarship support, enable us to have great facilities uh, like our School of Business and like the uh, Science and Engineering Hall and like the Milken Institute for uh, Public Health. These are great facilities and philanthropic support that provides capital is very important. We have many capital needs here that cannot be fulfilled with tuition revenue alone. So philanthropy is very important. And finally, one of the things that gives me uh, greatest reward is when I can go to a dean or even to a professor and say, I have a donor who has made a commitment to endow a new professorship. The endowed professorship is a way to recognize an individual for significant achievement and to support that individual in terms of education and scholarly contributions. And that is a very important gift that uh, can energize certainly an individual and a school as they aspire to build a very strong faculty. Students, faculty, and facilities along with really important programs, is what a great university is all about. George Washington University has these in significant measure, but I always say that the best can become better, and philanthropists help us do that.
Great. So I think we are, uh, you know, we still may be able to squeeze in a couple more questions. And I do want to ask you a couple of questions that students have submitted from the perspectives of you being a leader. So a lot of our students, for example, work on group projects. They work on cases. And they are faced constantly in these kind of things where they have very compelling but conflicting sides. Even myself, when I was, the, when I was taking on an administrative role, my department chair, I went to him and asked him, what, how do I make decisions? And he said, the key, Anuj, that you have to remember is that almost every issue has at least two sides. And the only word that is important there is at least. So I'm sure you are faced with decisions where they are very compelling arguments and they are conflicting. So tell us, walk us through how you are able to make decisions when all of these conflicting arguments are there. Well, I think the first thing that you need to realize is that people come forward with ideas with considerable passion and knowledge. And that combination is often extremely compelling. And I'm sure as a dean, you face what I faced as a department chair, as a provost, and as a chancellor, and now president. We have many people who have great ideas. We cannot respond to all of them in a measure that they would like. And so when you come to decisions, you have to re review all of the input and be uh, mindful that the people who are uh, coming forward with a request for decision, you know, expect an answer. So you have to have a rationale. You can't just go by the seat of your pants and, you know, make decisions right and left. Uh, I think you have to be very thoughtful and also consult with others who would be affected by a decision. And the overarching thought that I have in terms of decision making is to do so with you know, the institution in mind. What is going to be best for the institution? Uh, and we need to conduct ourselves with a high commitment to ethics. And in talking with you, I hope you understand that I will say the same thing to your fellow deans and being consistent uh, with respect to what is said about what will be top priority uh, needs to be you know, repeated across the institution. I can't tell you that the business school is the only thing that I'm going to support and then go to uh, arts and sciences and tell them the same thing. I see an opportunity for each of our 10 schools to make significant progress in the era ahead. And I would say that it's far better to be limited by money than by good ideas. We have you know, tremendous people and creative and dedicated. And I know that I'm not going to make a mistake in making investments because we're going to get a big return. The question is choosing among these talented individuals and their great ideas. And we're working together, uh, the provost, Chris Bracey, and I, and the 10 school deans are beginning to work together to identify the priorities that we will embrace as we look ahead. I'm very excited about uh, the opportunity to interact with such a great group of people. So you may have consistent message, but business school is still your favorite. After your daughter is an alum of the business school, President Wrighton. Uh, I know we are running uh, almost out of time, but I do want to ask one other question that the student had posed um, and, and, and wanted to know. Tell us something personal about you that we may not know, that you are OK to share. So that's your final question for the evening, <laughs> President Wrighton. Well, some of you already know that I have a dog. I also have a cat. And I, I called the cat Professor. And my wife and daughter uh, have insisted that the name is Maestro. But I prevail in, in, in the house in terms of 
I'm up early and I take the dog for a walk and I take the professor and give the cat the food. So I have a commanding situation. But one personal fact that uh, always sticks with me when people ask, you know, what, what personal thing that people do not know about you? I played Little League Baseball. Hmm. Tanya Vogel is the director of athletics. I'm very pleased to be able to be in her home here. I played Little League Baseball. I started right-handed, and then in the off-scene, I turned to left-handed, and I was a pitcher and first baseman. I once uh, struck out 18 batters in a six-inning game, Wow! and I lost the game because I hit <laughs> them or walked them. <laughs> well, our time has run out for questions. However, for those of you who are in person here, please stay around for the reception that follows immediately when this uh, session ends. Uh, meet President Biden and, and give, ha, ask him more questions when you network with him. Thank you, President Biden, again very much for joining us today. Thank it's you. It's been such a pleasure. Great here. to be with you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. I also want to thank all of you in person as well as those of you who have joined us online. And, of course, if you are in person, I invite you to join us for a reception. And, and next week, I hope to see you at George Talks Business Session with Inderpal Bhandari, Global Chief Data Officer at IBM. We look forward to this conversation and hope you can join us then again. Until then, goodbye. Thank you.